Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices, coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Welcome to Apex Express, news and views with an API point of view. This show was produced by a collective and several people pitched in this week. First, in response to the gang rape in Delhi, Apex contributor Preeti Mangala Shekhar joins us with another hat on as director of Narika. She joins Amita Swarin, director of Pure Health Exchange in Los Angeles, to talk about violence against women in South Asia and also here in the U.S. Preeti and Marie Che offer an interview with filmmaker Mira Nair about her latest project, The Reluctant Fundamentalist. And Ellen Choi shares a teaser for Navigating Queer Pacific Waves, a group exhibition of oceanic people at Galeria de la Raza. Keep it locked here for Apex Express. But first, we're super excited because we're launching a new regular segment on Apex Express, Apex Updates, headlines from around the globe. This is Marie Che with this week's Apex Update. From Canada to Hong Kong, people around the world kicked off the new year with massive protests. Over the holiday season, the Idle No More movement turned up the pressure on Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper by filling shopping malls and parks in rolling protests to assert Indigenous people's right to self-determination. Canada's Prime Minister Stephen Harper is meeting with First Nations chiefs tomorrow in hopes of quelling dissent. Meanwhile, Idle No More organizers will be holding a national dialogue between Indigenous chiefs and community representatives to build understanding between the grassroots movement and the formal leadership bodies. The Idle No More protests were sparked initially by people's opposition to Bill C-45, a budget bill that included changes to Indigenous people's decision-making processes. Since then, Idle No More has grown into a broader movement for self-determination and the protection of land, water, and people. The I Don't Know More movement, the indigenous movement, this is a continuation of the you know, 500 year long uh, indigenous resistance. It's much bigger than one piece of legislation. It's much b- bigger than you know, Prime Minister Harper, much bigger than any one piece of anything. It's, it's about this continual resistance that we got to a uh, consumeristic, non-indigenous, non-sustainable way of life. Idle No More organizers are also opposed to the Canada-China Foreign Investment Promotion and Protection Agreement, or FIPA, a trade deal that could accelerate the construction of the Enbridge Northern Gateway Pipeline, which would put Indigenous people's health and environment at risk. In Hong Kong, tens of thousands of protesters marched on New Year's Day, calling on Chief Executive Lung Chun Ying to step down. Their top concerns? A growing gap in wealth and rapidly rising home prices. Lung is also under fire for building illegal additions to his own home and implementing a national pro-communist party elementary school curriculum. Protesters are also calling for direct elections to replace a system where the chief executive is chosen by a 1,200-person body. Counter-protesters who came out in support of Lung were allegedly paid 250 Hong Kong dollars each to attend the protest. On New Year's Day, North Korean President Kim Jong-un made a rare public speech calling for the reunification of the Korean Peninsula and a peace treaty to end the Korean War. Meanwhile, in South Korea, newly elected President Park Geun-hye promised to engage with North Korea while warning of dangers posed by North Korean missiles. With the aid of the U.S. government, Park's administration is moving quickly to put in place a ballistic missile system capable of striking people anywhere in North Korea. Residents of Kandwa won a major victory this week against Vishwa Utilities, a company that is seeking to privatize the town's water supply. The Consumer Forum of Kandwa issued a stay and asked municipal authorities to address all of the objections raised by the over 10,000 residents who have registered their opposition to the privatization project. The project is part of India's development plan for small and medium-sized towns, and if it succeeds, Kandwa residents believe water prices could skyrocket to 10 times what they pay now. 
Residents have been protesting the plan for the past year. The next hearing is set for January 22nd. In the wake of a factory fire that killed 112 people, hundreds of Bangladeshi garment workers have staged a hunger strike to demand better pay and safer working conditions. Striking workers are calling on the government to arrest the manager of the Tazreen factory, who they blame for locking the doors and preventing workers from leaving when the fire broke out. The garment industry in Bangladesh generates about $20 billion each year, with 4,000 factories that produce clothing for major retailers in the U.S. and Europe. Garment workers in Bangladesh make a minimum wage of $37 per month, but labor organizations claim that many receive even less than that. The Tazreen factory produced clothing for American companies, including Walmart and Sears. A New York Times report released last week revealed that Walmart's inspection companies don't even check whether factories have emergency exits, fire escapes, or fireproof, smoke-proof staircases. Ground handlers at Hazrat Shahjalal International Airport in Dhaka, Bangladesh, brought flight operations to a halt on Tuesday morning with a seven-hour strike. Workers demanded that Biman Bangladesh Airlines provide full allowances for medical, meals, and uniforms. They are also demanding full-time jobs for workers who have been with the airline for five years. On Wednesday morning, just the day after the airport strike, ferry workers at river terminals across Bangladesh began an indefinite strike for better wages and safety on river routes. Thailand has instituted a national minimum wage of $9.88 per day over the protests of major corporations. In addition to the minimum wage, the government is now considering cutting the corporate tax rate from 30% to 20%. Two Indian soldiers were killed this week when Pakistani troops crossed the line of control that separates Indian and Pakistan-controlled areas of Kashmir. One of the two soldiers was found beheaded. Pakistan's High Commissioner Salman Bashir met with India's Foreign Secretary and condemned the attacks. The officials called on their respective governments to honor the ceasefire. Two suspected U.S. drone attacks killed at least eight people in northwestern Pakistan this week. There has been an increase in the frequency of U.S. drone attacks, and drones have killed 2,600 to 3,400 people in Pakistan since 2004. The Aerospace Industries Association, a trade group that represents some of the biggest U.S. weapons manufacturers, announced this week that they expect to increase weapons sales to Asian countries in 2013, particularly those bordering China and North Korea. They believe that the U.S.'s Pacific pivot, which is ramping up militarism throughout the region, will, quote, result in growing opportunities for our industry to help equip our friends. In 2012, weapons sales to countries in the U.S.'s Pacific Command Area of Activity rose to $13.7 billion, up 5.4% from the previous year. In 2013, weapons manufacturers are looking especially to Japan and South Korea to fuel weapons sales, as both countries recently elected conservative heads of state who are aligned with the U.S. military. The weapons trade group includes Lockheed Martin, Boeing, and Northrop Grumman New Jersey teenager Adam Kim is suing the Fort Lee Police Department for violating his civil rights. Last year, the Fort Lee Police locked Kim and five of his friends in a police van for 15 hours in below freezing temperatures, without food, water, or access to a toilet. The police had arrested about a dozen teenagers at a house party that night. They released the majority of them, but most of those who remained in custody were of Asian descent. According to Kim's complaint, police used racial slurs, referring to Kim and his friends as chinks. Kim claims that he suffered both physical and psychological injuries from the incident. In India today, the Metropolitan Magistrate Court proceeded with an in-camera hearing for the five men charged with the December kidnapping, gang rape, and murder of a 23-year-old student on a moving bus in Delhi. Lawyers, journalists, and members of the public packed the courtroom and angrily confronted lawyers who came forward to defend the accused. The magistrate then barred members of the public from the courtroom altogether and issued a gag order prohibiting journalists from reporting on the trial. The December rape sparked massive protests to which police responded with water cannons and tear gas. The police have since banned public assembly in the area near the federal building where the protests took place. The sixth man who was accused as a teenager and will appear before the Juvenile Justice Court on January 15th. And that's it for this week's Apex Update.
News of a brutal rape which led to the death of a woman in Delhi, named by some news outlets as Jyoti Singh Padi, has sparked an international outcry denouncing violence against women. While some commentaries blame a misogynistic culture in India, we wanted to have a more nuanced conversation on Apex Express. So I'm here with Amita Swaleen, who's the LA Executive Director of Peer Health Exchange, and she's also the project coordinator and cast member of Ping Chong and Company's Secret Survivors. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me here today. And no stranger to the KPFA Airwaves, Preeti Mangala Shekhar, who's the Executive Director of Narika. Hi, thank you for having me on the show. So to start off, um, why don't we just get familiar with sort of where you're coming from. So can you talk about where you work and what the mission is of the work that you do? My full-time job is at Peer Health Exchange, and we're a national nonprofit that trains college students to present health workshops in low-income public high schools that don't have health education. And one of the health workshops that we teach actually is focused on rape and sexual assault issues. Ping Chong and Company's Secret Survivors is a project that I started in 2009 with Ping Chong and Company, a theater group in New York City that features myself and four other survivors of child sexual abuse telling our stories through the arts. Wow. Okay, great. And um, what is Narika? So Narika is a Bay Area-based organization working to end domestic violence in South Asian communities in the Bay Area. And we uh, offer a helpline, uh, which is a resource for women specifically to uh, reach out to us uh, in confidentiality uh, and also in multiple languages. We offer support in various languages, various South Asian languages, and offer referrals, legal referrals, and counseling. um, And our mission is to build a movement to end violence against women and and to actively support women's rights as human rights. So the work that both of you are doing, uh, I'm sure that you had a reaction when you heard about the gang rape in Delhi, and then you saw the community come out in force in India. So what were your first reactions and what did you, you know, how are you processing what was happening? When I heard it, of course, it was very upsetting. It was very disturbing. In fact, I had just returned from a trip to India. Um, and one of the things we've seen with this now is there's, there was a huge explosion of media coverage, both uh, within India and also internationally. And that was both heartening, but also to, it was, you know, it was also good to see a huge wave of public protest in India. And also there's been a lot of solidarity vigils in the West, in the U.S. Um, and here in the Bay Area, Narika organized one in collaboration with other South Asian groups here, including Trukone, which works with the queer South Asian communities and and uh, uh, Alliance for South Asians Taking Action, a local South Asian activist collective. Um, other groups also signed down in solidarity, Asian Women's Shelter, Third Eye South Asian Films. So um, it was just a big you know, snowball effect of groups and solidarity here locally. Uh, in terms of my own response and you know, community response, it has been one of shock and dis- in deeply disturbed. Uh, but also we know that um, that this is not just one incident, it's part of a culture of rape and violence, uh, both in India and also here, as we know. So um, it was deeply, deeply upsetting, but also good to see like the outrage that the women's groups have been working on the ground here and in India for years addressing these issues. So, uh, you know, they've been much become much, much more visible. They've been always doing this work for years, but they've just become more visible. So that was heartening to see. And also um, that it wasn't just women who were out in protest, that men were out as well. Absolutely. I mean, I think I agree with Preeti that the protests, especially within the South Asian community here in the U.S., um, and of course, people in India themselves coming out and saying, this is not okay, we don't want this to be part of our culture moving forward, gives me a lot of hope for societal and structural change, hopefully on the horizon. And I think that work needs to absolutely include people of all genders. um, Because violence, frankly, sexual violence happens to people of all genders. So I'm really hoping that this leads to more and more conversations about the culture of rape in its full form, which to me is very much... It's focused traditionally on violence against women and violence against girls. I think in my work, particularly working on issues of child sexual abuse, which really don't discriminate around gender, I've 
had many conversations with male survivors of sexual assault and, you know, also some who have experienced sexual assault as male adults in institutions like prisons in the U.S. or the military in the U.S. I mean, the institutions that are part of our world, you know, also are built with sexual violence in their fabric. That's really what we're talking about when we say rape culture. So I'm really hopeful that this will be a catalyst for a conversation between people of all genders about the fact that this is not just a women and girls issue. And we don't just need males coming out in solidarity, you know, standing with survivors. We need many more males who are survivors themselves to feel like they can speak up. And I think we need to create space for that as well. This was a brutal rape. This was a brutal rape and murder. But um, in addition to that, why do you think that this was the tipping point where this amount of protest has risen up? It was a tipping point because I think it brought together a lot of issues. And of course, it happened to be Delhi, the capital. And the, just the brutality and the details around the this particular incident was so terrifying and horrifying. And uh, that kind of galvanized a lot of people. And it was like, enough is enough. It was, at some level, the tipping point. And we know, and, and Amita can also speak to this, that, uh, you know, we have a culture of rape universally in many societies um, across the world. And, and, in, and India is no exception. And uh, there's been rapes of... Uh, Dalit women, um, very marginalized women, um, and and also men. And I think even in this incident, particularly, uh, the 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 male friend accompanying the girl was also really violently attacked. But we haven't talked enough about that, or that has been kind of cast aside. Well, some people were saying that part of the outrage is that there's an assumption that if a woman goes out with a man, then she is safe. And in this case, she was out with a man, and they both got brutalized. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. I don't think that that's exceptional in human history, though. Again, when we talk about rape culture, when I think about issues of war or genocide that have happened in human history, talking again to individual survivors in communities here in the U.S., I don't hear stories only from women. But what I do hear from male survivors a lot is uh, how hard it is for them to speak out because of the constructs of patriarchy and the ways that within male culture and male community, there hasn't been enough space carved out for male survivors to step forward and talk about their trauma. So I'm not convinced that the rates are necessarily that different. I mean, in fact, when you look at rates of sexual violence against children in the U.S., there's a CDC statistic, Centers for Disease Control statistic, that show that one in four girls and one in six boys will experience sexual abuse by the age of 18. Not that different. But we don't really have a national consciousness of ending violence against men and boys the same way we do around women and girls. And I think that if we really want to end this kind of violence and pull it out of the fabric of our society, we really have to talk about violence, sexual violence uh, and mass violence against people of all genders, Uh, you know, admitting that it might uh, look different, that the forms of that violence that might manifest differently. But again, in this particular case, as Preeti mentioned, the young man was not only pulled off the train, from what I understand, but stripped naked. And I think that's also a form of sexual violence. And, bus, yeah, yeah f- sorry, from the bus. And, you know, we haven't heard his story. And, and really, the way that we have then framed this in the media as an issue of violence against women and girls is is too simplistic. Well, there has been critique of how the media has covered it. There's a lot of finger pointing to India, and there are statistics brought up about like only 25% of rapes are convicted. But then when you look at the U.S. conviction rate, it, it mirrors that. So are there other problems that you're seeing in the way that the media is handling this incident? You know, we've seen this before, the the way that Western media can serve as a tool of what I would call neocolonialism. I mean, recently in this particular case with the, the bus violence in India, you see British media in particular coming out and painting India as, what do they say now, the, the worst G20 country in the world for women to live in based on this incident and the coverage that it's getting. And I just think we need to remember that England used to be a colonial power in India. And so it's very easy for a British woman in the Times of London to write an article pitying the women of India and pointing fingers and saying, like, this is because of a very primitive male mentality of, you know, women hating men in India, and that's what all Indian men are. And I think that any of us who are Indian American ourselves can point to a number of men in our communities and our families who are incredibly loving, just like you can in any community, right? Well, and also to reinforce the point that you mentioned, Robin, that statistics are also awful here in the U.S. Conviction rates for rape is like 26%, which is also abysmally low. UK too, the Guardian article um, titled that like now the West can look 
to India for, you know, for shaming India. Um, it's a very excellent analysis of how uh, rates are, are pretty low in the UK too. So so in terms of numbers too, uh, this is a huge issue everywhere, also in the West. And also, um, you know, we live in a misogynistic culture everywhere. It manifests differently. One of the things in terms of talking to people here and some South Asians who I talk to say, oh, I, I wouldn't want to raise my daughter in India. And I'm like... Yeah, we do. You know, there are issues here. Of course, I want to also point out that there are certain very uh, specific challenges uh, in Indian society. Like, for instance, pervasive street sexual harassment, you know, the one, the kind you face in public transport or, you know, even in the streets in many big Indian cities is, is you know, it's it's a day to day thing. It's not it's non-negotiable. It's like we don't talk about it. You accept it as a way of life. And also, marriage. I also want to emphasize that marital rape is is not uh, there's no law to protect women against marital rape in India. So, you know, there may be stronger laws here, but again, enforcement then becomes an issue. So just to point out that sometimes maybe comparing just statistics is like comparing apples and oranges, but this is an issue here. Are there any other critiques that you have of the discussions that are happening in the media right now? I mean, I think a critique that I have not is not just about the media, but also about what many people are calling for is just the media's emphasis on criminal penalties. And I read an article recently that was basically celebrating the fact that maybe this incident will serve as an incident to strengthen Indian laws and have harsher penalties for particularly men who engage in sexual assault of women. And, you know, one of the assailants in this case was 17, from what I understand. And many people are saying maybe this will be the time that India then revokes its um, exemption of prosecuting juveniles as adults. Right now, they have, in my opinion, a much more humane criminal justice system than we do in the U.S. And uh, in, in terms of, you know, we have the largest prison system in the world. Um, and I think it would be a huge mistake for the world's largest democracy to follow the lead of the world's most punitive democracy. You know, I, I don't understand how that would lead us to justice. We have seen in the United States very clearly that the harsh criminal sentencing that we have and the prison system that we have, first of all, doesn't prevent sexual assault and secondly, doesn't rehabilitate anyone who goes through prison. I mean, in fact, I would argue that sexual assault is really built into the fabric of our prison system. There's a, you know, um, an organization that's based in LA called Just Detention International that specifically works to end prison rape because it's such a huge problem. So I would just want to signal to all of the people calling for harsher criminal pen penalties through media outlets that that's not the way. I think there's been a lot of progressive women's organizers in India actually calling for transformative justice and even saying that that movement has existed in the U.S. as well and that that's what we should all be pushing for throughout the world. Those of us who are working to end rape culture need to be looking outside of criminal legal systems because we've seen that they don't work. And also the stigma that that that's another issue that has been bothering a lot of us feminists, activists, especially the stigma around rape and reporting rape as it is, you know, a lot of people don't report rape because it's shameful, quote unquote shameful, because it's it's it's, you know, it's framed that way. But even when they, they, when in India, especially when women try to report rape, there's a lot of uh, it's 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 another process of uh, violation in itself. The way uh, police file the taking the cases, the way you're scrutinized, the way you know if it goes to court and if it goes to trial, um, how lawyers scrutinize it, and there's a lot of uh, onus for the woman to prove the, the the rape and also how she's judged. And there's what is called a two finger t test that doctors administer where to see if a woman is quote unquote comfortable with sex too. So her sexual history then is subject to scrutiny. So these are like, as you can see, very patriarchal framed and controlling women's sexuality. And that's, I think, women's groups now in India, just looking at the kind of mobilizing that they're doing, the signs that you see on Facebook and other social media, it's so heartening to see that they're beginning to challenge that day-to-day -day misogyny, the day-to-day -day way we live our lives, way the way girls and women are treated contributes to this violence you know it's not something that uh, you know somebody asked me like one of my aunts asked me like why are indian men so violent i'm like <laughs> men are violent we live in a patriarchal society so yeah. well and i think we could just bring it back here to the u.s and look at the 2012 election and that's when todd aiken yes. of missouri who was talking about if it was a legitimate rape a woman's body would not have bear a child based on that, right? Mm -hmm. 
it would be a mistake for, again, for us in the West and particularly in the United States. I mean, we're a country founded on genocide and slavery, both of which are forms of mass violence that I'm sure incorporated sexual violence. I mean, we know that in Native American communities, the boarding schools were an institutional way of sexually abusing Native American children to dominate them and to break their culture, right? That's in the foundations of this country. So we should be, as Americans, never wants to point fingers to other countries about their rape culture. I mean, we have a vicious rape culture here in the United States. I think the point is, as Preeti was pointing out, the way that misogyny manifests here, the way that violence against all peoples manifests may be different country to country. So for me, I think this is a moment to stand in solidarity with the people of India and say we, you know, really are supportive of your efforts to change your society while doing work every single day to change our own. Because we certainly have a massive problem of sexual violence here. It just, again, manifests differently on a day-to-day basis. Well, I think some of it is how does a community offer self-care, right? So in 2009, um, at a Richmond high school, a young girl was gang raped brutally And people watched and did not call the cops. And that led to State Senator Leland Yee trying to initiate some legislation where it becomes a crime to not report a crime. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, more recently in 2012, word was getting out, and this is a way that the community took care of itself, that there was a violent rapist in the Mission District. And so all across social media, people were saying, like, be careful. He's been hitting women up along this street. It's been very violent. And it led to an arrest, right? But it was a way that people in the community were looking out for each other when the police didn't even want to announce it. Community groups were getting the word out. So in closing, what what are your organizations doing here that would address this culture of violence that we have? Well, Pure Health Exchange does have a program here in the Bay Area. So we're working with thousands of high school students, mainly in Oakland, uh, where college students are coming into high schools and having a dialogue about rape and sexual assault as part of our workshop curriculum on health and wellness. And when you talk about the curriculum that's being taught, like what does that look like? Yeah, so our dialogue as Pure Health Exchange with ninth graders uh, is training college students to lead a workshop we have a 13 workshop curriculum and it largely focuses on giving teens the knowledge and skills to make healthy decisions. So the book ends of the curriculum are around decision making skills and communication skills. And with that in mind, we share statistics about rape and sexual assault in the curriculum. We also give out resources of the RAIN hotline, for example, and other local resources in each of the cities we work on where people can go to if get rape counseling, rape crisis counseling, report a sexual violence assault, um, but also a dialogue around consent and what consent looks like and how to know that you're making consensual decisions, how to make sure that you're asking for consent if you're going to be sexually active with someone. You know, Secret Survivors is a tool that can be used anywhere. And just yesterday, we had a screening in the Bay Area that included three local activists and organizers working here, particularly members of the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collaborative, who are a network of people saying, Harsher criminal penalties are not the way. Stronger laws to make it a crime for someone to not report a crime are not the way. Because for those of us living in criminalized communities, whether we're queer and trans, and we know that the criminal legal system actually prosecutes and and penalizes our communities much more than others, um, whether we're living in immigrant communities and there's fear of deportation and detention, whether we're living in black and Latino communities where there's overrepresentation of the state in the child welfare system, taking children away from their parents, incarcerating people at mass numbers disproportionately. I don't think that we can rely on the police and the criminal legal system and prisons as a solution, right? We need to be taking care of each other, as you've said, in much more creative ways. And I think for some inspirational stories uh, from an organization that no longer exists, but that was headquartered here in the Bay, Creative interventions. They do have an online story archive called the Storytelling and Organizing Project. The The website is stopviolenceeveryday.org. And there's a online network of stories of people intervening in issues of interpersonal violence without calling the police, right? And we need to be more creative. It's not easy work, but the police are not going to save us. The state is not going to save us. This fabric is too deeply in our families, our communities. And frankly, I think it's important to name that in most cases of sexual violence, we know the data tells us that the perpetrator is very very intimately known to their victim. So you're talking about cases in where if you want to have justice and you want to put an end to the violence, it has to look differently than saying you have to lock up and prosecute this person who you probably love and who is dear to you and who you have a relationship of some kind with. 
and Narika. Advocacy is a huge part of our work and that means talking about the systemic frameworks within which these issues come out, right? Like, So in, in the South Asian context, cultural context, there's a lot of systemic patriarchy as there is in others that we've discussed but specifically since we work within the South Asian communities one of the issues for instance we talk about is sun preference right like there's a huge preference for sons in our communities uh, sons are valued you know so from birth or even before birth you know a lot of families want to have sons right so the the, the misogyny starts there so we really have to talk about why this is and there's a lot of uh, you know colonial context to also how these got strengthened over time in Indian society. So uh, so really talking about these issues within our community is one priority for um, our organ, our, for Narika in collaboration with other South Asian communities too because um, we also see this as a range of issues. It's not just violence is linked to so many issues as Amita has beautifully pointed out. And as we know, those of us who work, it's it's related to class. It's related to, again, you know, in, in, the, in the context of the U.S., again, the racial context becomes important. So we work in solidarity with other groups and also... Uh, within with other South Asian groups and then also homophobia within our communities. These are all linked to issues of violence, right? These are very hard issues to talk about, so I think it's going to be a long time. It's not going to be a slow, quick, you know, it's not going to be a quick uh, transformation and it's not going to be instant. So, uh, but I think just seeing how the mobilization continues to happen in India, for instance, around this incident, it's heartening to see that the work has kind of begun. But it has to continue. And I think those of us who have already been doing this work for years have, you know, it's also exciting, but it's also we have to gear up to do more of this going forward. Um, Do you have any other thoughts that you want to share before we sign off? I mean, the last thing I want to say is what I've seen on social media, a dialogue within particularly the South Asian American community, is someone expressed the idea that maybe it's a blessing in disguise that the young woman who was victimized in this case died because they couldn't imagine how someone could recover from something so horrible. And, you know, I personally have spoken quite publicly about the fact that I was sexually assaulted by my own father over 300 times throughout my childhood. And Although it has been a really difficult healing journey and not one that I necessarily would have asked for, of course, uh, I don't think that it's anyone else's choice but my own to decide whether or not I deserve to get up in the morning and whether or not I should be able to walk that struggle. And I've chosen to do so with a lot of strength, but with a lot of support and you know, again, although it's hard, it is possible. I do feel like I've healed greatly in the past 17 years of my adult life. And I would never want anyone to think that we should look at this woman only in pity or with the mentality that she's better off dead. I think that's really unfair to the thousands and probably millions of human beings that exist every day after having survived such unspeakable crimes. And I think it's really important that we all work within our communities to undo that stigma that Preeti was talking about. And to realize that there's no shame in talking about having survived sexual violence. Um, and many of us live within, with that strength within us every day, even today. When I was in India this time, in my home city of Madras, and when I go around late at night, say after, even late by 9, is 9 p.m. is late, you see the place is suddenly a very male space. Public spaces, it's as though, you know, there are no women around. And so I think... Uh, You know, and we've had Take Back the Nights here and we have had Take Back the Nights in India, in many college campuses. So uh, I think it's a time with with all the galvanizing, it's exciting to see that. And I think it's it's a good opportunity for us to reclaim public spaces. I mean, one of the issues is safety in public spaces, too. You know, like as much as the home is a very violent space for for, you know, girls and women and, you know, and for children, uh, public spaces are actually very safe spaces, but they're touted as, you know, it's, it's not safe for women to hang out there, right? And we need to reclaim that. So I think I see this as an opportunity to do that. There are women's groups in India that have done remarkable research and work around talking about the joys of, so women need to go out in public spaces and enjoy, just hang out. You know, you might think, what is the, what is revolutionary about going out and hanging out in a public space? But it actually is. And I think, that is that at a symbolic level is happening through this street protests and the vigils and the you know solidarity protests that are happening and also to, to see men be a part of that is very heartening uh, we need male allies and so i'm i'm hopeful that this will lead to something uh, positive and safe in the long run for people everywhere that was an insightful conversation with two leaders in the south asian community preeti mangala shekar and amita swadeen 
We spoke on Sunday after Amita's screening of The Secret Survivors, a documentary on the theater project discussing strategies to end childhood sexual abuse in our communities. Since then, word has traveled around the social media sphere about an attempted rape in the Mission District last weekend. At the intersection of 23rd and Guerrero, a woman fought off her attacker. He only fled when she could finally scream and a neighbor opened their window and turned on their light. In response, a march is being organized for Friday at 4 p.m. at the 16th Street BART station. This awareness campaign is not to scare women into staying off the street, but rather an attempt to unite with our allies to take back the night and to commit to make ourselves more aware of our surroundings and ways we can support each other. Here's a short track of a Riot Girl compilation from 1995 called Free to Fight, Self-Defense for Women and Girls. If you choose to fight, then remember these are the places to hit. Eyes, knees, groin, throat. Eyes, knees, groin, throat. Eyes, knees, groin, throat. Eyes, knees, groin, throat. Eyes are easily poked. Ouch! The knees are easily kicked out. The groin is a sensitive spot. When you hit the throat, it hurts a lot. Eyes, knees, groin, throat. One of the programs for the Mill Valley Film Festival's 35th anniversary last October included a tribute to Mira Nair. This world-renowned filmmaker has directed the award-winning film Monsoon Wedding, Mississippi Masala starring Denzel Washington, and The Namesake starring Cal Penn. Her new film, The Reluctant Fundamentalist, is an adaptation of Pakistani author Mohsin Hamid's novel of the same name. It follows Chengiz, a Pakistani Wall Street shark, trained in the ways of market capitalism. His life changes after the 9-11 attacks when he endures increasing Islamophobia, breaks up with his American lover, and returns to Pakistan to teach at a university. There, he's a constant target of religious fundamentalism and realizes that caught between corporate capitalism and that of religious frenzy, he has no real choice. Preeti Mangala Shekhar and Marie Che met up with Mira Nair after the film's U.S. premiere in Mill Valley. Music played a wonderful role in your film and uh, it's woven, it begins the film and it's there throughout the film. Can you speak to that? Well, music is for me what keeps me going, you know, it's the breath of life, it's what really propelled me and through yet each film, but particularly through this one, because The Reluctant Fundamental is, is by far the most difficult film I have ever made and no one wanted this film financed. It took five years to make it, three years to adapt it, two years to finance it and and uh, to make it at the scale I wanted to make it at. And music would you know, keep me going because I would uh, hear uh, Fez, Ahmed Fez's poems, uh, Mori Araj Suno, you know, in ghazal form almost every day, uh, which is a poem that says, heed me, O Lord, heed me, you know, listen to my word. And if you don't listen, you know, it's like a challenge. If you don't heed me, I will change you for another God. It's this kind of shout out to something higher, to help. And uh, it, it used to be my anthem by making this film. So, and Pakistani modern sound is the most exciting sound there is. Coming to the women in the movie, you had an amazing star cast of very well-known actors, Shabana Azmi. Was it a struggle for you to give them stronger characters in a movie that's about men and the male world of terrorism, fundamentalism, foreign policy, you know, and, um, mullahs? Family life of Chengiz in Pakistan was very important to me. Uh, we used to jokingly, in the writing of it, uh, Mohsin would tease me and call it call it monsoon terrorist <laughs> because it was like a, you know sort of monsoon wedding esque Pakistani Punjabi family, and we made the brother of Chengiz in the book a sister in the film mm. uh, because actually precisely I don't like those 
so called muslim subject films where they you hardly see any women at all and when you go to pakistan or any part of the subcontinent women are the most vigorous body sexy uh, funny beautiful uh, great presences holding everything together but also with great style and panache and um so yeah the film is about chingez and his journey and his journey is in a world of largely men but so women are always vital to me and mm -hmm. uh, whether they are central to the story or not um but hopefully you get a sense of that in this right, world right. and you get it like you said you know you prefer the economy of the the visual yeah. as a photographer as somebody who loves photography and that's something that's that ethic you bring into your films so are, who influence who are your main influences in films or who inspire you you talked about the battle of algiers for every film somehow it ends up to be that i arm myself or fuel myself with some film or another you know and for uh, in um, the reluctant fundamentalist it was olivier ayas uh, asayas's carlos which is an absolutely brilliant portrait of carlos the jackal in a 5 hour film uh, which i carried with me and occasionally would see uh, in terms of that kind of electricity of it you know not quite knowing when you know it would ever stop you know that type of feeling uh, which i wanted to convey in the making of reluctant So I I love uh, Olivia Asayas's work. I love Michael Mann, uh, Kusturitsa. Jane Campion is one of my great friends and my I really l worship her work and her risk taking, you know, constantly going to only where her beating heart tells her to go, you know, and uh, uh, and giving us a world that is uh, almost always never seen before, you know. So it's the people who pursue what makes them impassioned that i follow you know uh, because uh, inspiration is a great privilege and as as you work more and more it's not often that you get to know that you're in, that, that, that you get to feel inspired so mm -hmm. when you are inspired to do something as i was with this film i mean just i just almost gave up cinema in the struggle to make the reluctant fundamentalist because the movie fell apart three times it was too much then you know four or five years into it my living away from my family which is waiting for you know the financial world to wake up to understand that this thing needed to be as complex and as layered as it was and whatever uh but i'm really glad we pushed on and i'm really glad that the doha film institute uh, just gave us the freedom with which to make a you know political film without really censorship i want to preface this next question which is a good segue for us uh, because i am a fan of yours but we all you know what makes good radio is also provocative conversations and i was wondering if you could speak to how your films are perceived back home in india what do you think of critics that say that it, sometimes you exoticize it for a western audience which i don't agree myself because of being able to do this back and forth um way of looking at life in india and here how do you respond to that i thought that was an old critique yeah yeah it's true lately they like me yeah but well, also because you made amelia you made vanity fair you know you've kind of expanded your no i i thought monsoon wedding made me you know uh, embraced in the fold <laughs> That's true. Well, and the namesake, which was a big hit in India. I like namesake for. I didn't like the book. I loved the movie, which yeah. I think is huge for a filmmaker because uh -huh. it's a struggle to make a good film out of a great book. Yeah. Can you maybe share your process a little bit of how films kind of can be made out of books without being intimidated by what the author and. Well, I've always had actually terrific experiences with the writers of both the novels lately that I've been involved with adapting. Uh Jhumpa uh, Lahiri for the namesake and Mohsin Hamid for Reluctant. Um both are uh I have to say my greatest treasures are they are both really close friends of mine and almost family uh for me in my life. Both understood that you know films are their own animal and that if a film is another way of speaking of this book and not to hold on to it in fact uh, mohsin came on the ride as uh, one of the first screenwriters with ami boghani of of the adaptation because um 
it was tough to find a screenwriter that would have the knowledge of the subcontinent and that world and not have the arrogance and the myopia that is often associated with it, really. Mm -hmm. I talked to A-list writers for almost a year and a half after buying the novel, and uh, you know, known writer said to me, well, first off, let's just drop fundamentalism for the title. I said, really? And he said, yeah, you could drag me to see a film with fundamentalist in it. And I said, well, thank you so much. You know, I mean, that just showed me where we would go. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't going to happen, you know. This was the most difficult adaptation because it's a monologue in the book and it's a whole world in the, no in the movie. And we had to create what I wanted was a third act. When Cengiz falls out of love with America and comes back to Pakistan, what does he do there? You know, and I wanted to very much make it a portrait of contemporary Pakistan, not 10 years ago, 9-11, you know. And the casting is what makes you bring it all together very well. And you have this unique process where you, your cast has to do yoga in the morning. Well, and if they uh, wish. You know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yoga is a voluntary thing. Yeah. It's just that it's something that we, I offer. Yeah. Yeah. And actually people often say yes to come work with me because they have, they have the privilege of doing great yoga every morning. And actually yoga replenishes you in the course of wearing yourself out making a film. Uh, when you turned on Harry Potter a few years ago, was that a hard decision or could you speak to that? I think that's... Every filmmaker would probably jump at that opportunity. How is that for you, and how how do how do you feel about it looking back? Oh, I, I have no regrets at all. It was a great lesson from my son, actually, Zoran, who was uh, 14 at the time, and he had really learned to read uh, from the Harry Potter books, and and I thought that I'd have to take this seriously for his sake, and and it was him who said to me, uh, you know, Mama, any good filmmaker can make uh, Harry Potter, but only you can make the namesake. I was two months away from shooting the namesake when that happened, you know, so, I mean, I was deep in the inspiration of the namesake, and mm -hmm. So it was not so hard to keep to that path, you know. But, you know, I mean, it was lovely to be asked. Mm -hmm. uh, Marie, did you oh, yeah, just one question. Yes. You mentioned a couple of times, like, how difficult it was to make this film and how long of a process it was. So, like, what was the thing that, like, inspired you and motivated you to, like, keep going? And this was truly, without being dramatic, uh, the hardest film in my career to make. And I genuinely considered giving up cinema in April of last year, I guess, because the film had started and stopped three times, you know, and we literally had to send the crew home each time. And it was, you know, a lot of sacrifice uh, to be away from the family, just waiting, pitching, hustling, watching, or, you know. Music kept me going a lot, you know, the, the kind of music I use in the film, music that was like, uh, you know, a, an appeal to someone higher, you know, please, you know, listen, you know, keep me on course, keep me on this path. But what fueled me was to tell the story of Cengiz, who, who is us all, you know, uh, in, a, in a sense of being viewed as the other and yet being a human being, you know, and how do you understand who you really are when you are viewed that way. The Western world and the subcontinental world do not seek to even have dialogue so that any kind of understanding or any kind of bridge making can happen. And um, for me that was what the reluctant fundamentalist was and is, is this dialogue about bigger issues of our time but really through the palpable beating of a human heart, you know, in Cengiz, in a young man who, from Pakistan, who loves America, who uh, achieves the America he wishes, and then falls out of love with it, uh, and comes back home, uh, only to come to a home that is now, you know, literally the subject of drones. Um, so that was my intention, is to make this bridge, to make this possibility of understanding these two worlds that I actually intimately love and know, to try to tell both sides with the equal intimacy and anguish and love and pain, and not to just make one side complicated, because the world is complicated <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> I'm glad you persevered and the movie made the light of day. It's important. 
That was a discussion by Preeti Mangala Shekhar and Marie Che with filmmaker Mira Nair when she was in the Bay Area last fall for the U.S. premiere of her latest film, The Reluctant Fundamentalist, at the Mill Valley Film Festival. <laughs> Choi previews an amazing community art exhibition at Galeria de la Raza. It's called Navigating Queer Pacific Waves, and this week I was able to get one of the featured artists, Jean Melisane, to take a break from their hard work prepping for the show to give us the 411. She also gives us a sneak preview of the groundbreaking art that will be showcased. So tell us, what's the art show called this Saturday, and what, how did you guys come up with the idea for it? So the art show is called Navigating Queer Pacific Waves. And we came up, I came up with this idea with one of my mentors. Her name is Fui Fui Lupe Numatolu. She's Tongan. And we're both uh, queer Pacific Islanders. So, I mean, just being Pacific Islander artists or Pacific Islander people in America, you don't get to see us in the arts as much as other, you know, other folks. So... That's why I think we wanted to do anything on Pacific Islanders. And so the art show is centered on different stories of queer Pacific Islanders? Correct. Um, I was like raised with this organization. It's in the South Bay, Silicon Valley Debug. We, our motto is experience is, is the ultimate authority. No one could say that you didn't go through what you did. So. For Pacific Islanders, when I was like doing interviews and whatever, I'm just like, damn. Like, it's, we have a lot of trauma. There's like a stigma with island people that we're happy, we live in paradise or whatever. You know, like, I mean, that paradise is, um, is being taken to. I just think about people who have to deal with this. Like, even in urban diaspora, one of my little cousins that's in the show too, they grew up in West Point. West Point's pretty well known. It's a, it's a project in San Francisco. I had breakfast with her and her brother, and they're both, um, they're both, they wouldn't identify as queer. I had to teach them that word. It's interesting. But she's in a relationship with another young woman. And, um, you know, her parents are from Samoa, but she was raised all her life in San Francisco. And, like, when you hear Bayview, every time I heard of Bayview, like, I never hear anything about Samoans in Bayview, and we've been there forever. So, like, to hear her story, just to be around my family and to hear their stories, like you don't hear these stories ever. We're sitting here in the living room and I see like a beautiful cutout of a person's face and some designs. I see some skateboards that are cut up over there. <laughs> so can you describe maybe like a couple pieces that are in the show? Um, we're gonna have a, a Poanua, which is, um, it's a Maori totem pole. And the totem pool is made out of skateboards. There's going to be photos we pasted on there to build a totem pool. I was recently in Oahu and I went to the Hawaiian Palace. It was just a trip to see like a lot of the art was like very colonial art, you know. It, it looked like art you would see like in England in the palace, you know. Because if you look back, the only people that could afford art was like royalty. So like to me, like these people are like very royal to me. They should be like pieces that are like, my interpretation of like royal portraits for them, not in a colonial way, not in like, you know, I'm gonna paint this picture that looks exactly like this. Who are the other artists in the show? Jorge um, Gonzalez. He's not Pacific Islander, but he's like super dope ally. He's an installation artist and he'll be working on like his piece. It's very, super duper powerful. He's working with a narrative of a young Pacific Islander girl who is queer and she committed suicide. So it's going to be a super powerful 
um, installation in, in honor of that girl. So, um, and other people who who died that way. And then the other artist is uh, Joy Inamoto. She's from Hawaii, she's Hawaiian. And then the other artist, Dan Talapapa. He's like OG right there. It's a funny story because when I was in high school, I like used to always search for Pacific Islander artists. When they had Yahoo and I, and I like Yahoo Pacific Islander artists, his name came up. So I emailed him when I was in high school. And so it's like uh, uh. full circle because I'm in a, you know, I'm doing a show and he's in it. There's going to also be a piece from the Pacific Islander women in Chowchilla prison, just in solidarity of folks um, that are incarcerated because a lot of Pacific Islanders, everyone who's Pacific Islander, I'm pretty sure knows someone that's incarcerated or has family that's incarcerated. So it's good to remember. And that was an excerpt from my interview with featured artist Jean Melisane, who's putting on the amazing community art show, Navigating Queer Pacific Waves, this Saturday, January 12th, at Galleria de la Raza in San Francisco's Mission District. You can go to galeriadelaraza.org for more info. Now for the community calendar. Tomorrow, Friday at 4 p.m., meet at the 16th Street BART station for a Mission Solidarity March to keep the streets safe. On Saturday, January 11th, Galeria de la Raza hosts the opening for Navigating Queer Pacific Waves at 7.30. Tune in next week when Apex Express brings a more in-depth feature on the exhibition. On Wednesday, January 16th, Oakland Asian Cultural Center has a closing reception for their exhibition, We Are America, Resistance and Resilience. The exhibition features a 100-year timeline about the civil rights of Filipinos, providing a visual account of Filipino resistance to discrimination and a chronology of the community's struggle for equality. For more information on the community calendar, to subscribe to our podcast, or to listen to our archives, visit our website, apexexpress.org. If you have a show idea or you'd like to get involved with our collective, email us at apex at kpfa.org. Our intro and outro music is by Asian Crisis. Up next is The Bonnie Simmons Show. Mm